Most parents want their children to have a better life than they did. Ha! <laughs> That's some nonsense. I want the best life. Look, some of the parents want to live out their failed dreams through their kids. In either case, there's only so much you can do as a parent to help your child and give them the best opportunities possible. But what if you could help take chance out of the equation. Luck is always going to be a part of any success story, even if it was just the luck of being born into a wealthy and well-connected family. But you know, not everything has to be left to chance. What if you could give your child increased intelligence, athletic ability, musical talent, work ethic, and remove any undesirable traits that might otherwise hinder their development and success? Or maybe you're the superficial type that doesn't really care how talented or capable your kid is, as long as they have the right color hair, the right eyes, the right skin. Look, such is the dream of a designer baby. A child whose DNA has altered before birth to give them all of the advantages in life. Portrayals of a future like this can be seen all over popular media, like the 1997 movie Gattaca, which is an excellent movie, even though it totally doesn't address why Ethan Hawke and Jude Law don't look alike. Watch the movie, you'll get what I mean. So in the movie, genetically designed children are the norm, with natural birth being frowned upon. Those born naturally are referred to as invalids. And while it is supposed to be illegal to discriminate based on that, eugenics goes hand in hand with discrimination pretty much by definition. In a lot of ways, the film is more about the indomitable human spirit and the crushing weight of parental expectations rather than about the science and the moral aspects of designer babies, but it is fortunately not entirely ignored. Indeed, the morality of designer babies may be the most pressing question that we as a civilization have to answer because this isn't some sort of science fiction question that's hanging in the distant future. This is taking place right now. We have to decide. The world's first designer baby. The technology to cherry pick all of a child's genetic traits from a menu isn't available yet, but depending on who you ask, there have already been designer babies born. Born on the 29th of August 2000, Adam Nash became the world's first designer baby. Sort of. Adam is an older sister, Molly, who was born with a rare genetic blood disorder called Fanconi anemia. The disease causes bone marrow to decrease the production of blood cells and results in an average life expectancy of only 20 to 30 years. And obviously, that's not a good thing, and Molly needed stem cell therapy if she was going to live a long and healthy life. But in order to save Molly's life, Adam was born from in vitro fertilization. Several embryos were created and subjected to pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. The doctors had to select an embryo that appeared to be both free of the genetic disease and would likely be a match as a donor for Molly. The implantation was successful, and after Adam was born, the stem cells from his umbilical cord were transplanted into Molly to cure her of her disease. And at this point, science is f cool, right? Look, when we use the term designer babies, this is obviously not what most people think of. In the case of Adam, nothing was actually designed. The egg cells were fertilized normally. They were just inspected first to find the best one for their specific needs. Though he is regarded by many as the world's first designer baby, a more accurate and also frequently used term might be a savior sibling. It also sounds a bit nicer, less like a Gucci bag. Adam is only one of many savior siblings. Or we can't say they're exactly common, since a savior sibling is only useful in treating certain rare diseases, specifically genetic diseases that can be tested for and are monogenic, meaning there is only a single gene that accounts for the disease. Genetically testing and selecting embryos for implantation as a savior sibling is somewhat controversial, or at least it was, but there do not appear to be any laws in the world outlawing the practice. Good. In fact, there are almost no laws regarding it at all anywhere. In the United Kingdom, the practice is explicitly legal, and in Victoria, Australia, it is reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. That's all the laws regarding savior siblings in the entire world. Now, frankly, this shouldn't be that controversial in the first place. In vitro fertilization is expensive, and even under the best circumstances, it's pretty much a coin toss whether it will result in a successful pregnancy. If someone is going to go through all of that effort, it only seems fair that they should be allowed to have the doctors double check to make sure that the embryo used doesn't have a fatal genetic disorder or an extra chromosome. And if they're going to take a peek anyway, I mean, why not select an embryo that will save the life of another child? while they're at it. Where's the harm? Look, in this scenario, nothing is being altered, nothing is being designed, so the world as a whole seems to have agreed that this is 
fair game. But Adam is 22 years old now, and medical technology has come an incredibly long way in that time. With the ease and cost effectiveness of CRISPR Cas9 for gene editing, a future where babies have had their genetic material altered while still embryos cannot be that far away. In fact, we predict that this future will arrive in exactly negative four years. You see, it's easy to predict the past. The world's first genetically modified embryos. Much of the world has outlawed the practice of genetically altering an embryo. Surprisingly, the United States is not one of those countries. Rather than explicitly banning it, the US will not allow government funds to be used for research such as this, and the FDA will also not approve any process for doing so. But something as trivial as legality has never stood in the way of a mad scientist before, and it wasn't going to stand in the way for China's He Jiankui. Jiankui's goal was to modify the CCR5 gene in embryos to give them a mutation that would make the babies immune to HIV. He altered several embryos, resulting in three births, twins Lulu and Nana, and another child named Amy. Jiankui revealed his research at a presentation he gave at a conference in Hong Kong. The scientific community at large was not exactly thrilled with his controversial decision to perform clinical trials trials on gene editing in human embryos, and neither was the Chinese government. Jiang Kui spent three years in prison and was just released a few months ago. Three years in jail is a pretty small price to pay for a medical achievement that would change the world and eradicate HIV, but that's not actually what happened. Jiang Kui never published his work. His manuscripts were eventually sent to MIT Technology Review, and upon peer review, his work appears to have been misguided at best and, well, dangerous and irresponsible at worst. Jiang Kui was using a crude version of CRISPR-1 and injecting it into embryos, hoping that he would get the desired results. The CCR5 gene did mutate, but not into the prevalent variant that causes HIV immunity. The new gene and its effects are unknown. The girls were reported to have been born healthy before he gave his presentation, but their current whereabouts are completely unknown. The conclusions found in the manuscripts also appear to be total fabrications and a complete misrepresentation of the data. By all accounts, Jiang Kui put his own desires above those of the parents or the children and tried to fabricate conclusions that would justify his illegal research even when the data didn't support them. Mad scientist and a bad scientist. When he first made the announcement that he had genetically modified embryos before birth, the scientific community was shocked and appalled that someone would be so irresponsible. Having now seen his manuscripts, the best word to describe their reaction would be outrage. Even if Jiankui didn't get the desired results, could his experiment work, though, as a proof of concept? Well, he showed that an embryo's genes can be modified and lead to a normal, healthy birth. Probably. I mean, uh, we still don't know what happened to those girls later on. Look, if we assume they're alive and well, does this open the door to future experimentation by modifications by more responsible scientists? Scientific Concerns now, this may come as a surprise, but DNA is pretty fucking complicated. There's a lot of it, and it does a lot of stuff. Take the CCR5 gene that Jiang Kuo was trying to alter. In addition to being able to grant an immunity to HIV, the gene also plays a role in memory and cognition. And by altering it, it could also make the subject more susceptible to West Nile virus and the flu. So look, a single gene performs multiple tasks, meaning that changing one gene could have unintended consequences. So is having an extra tool child or a child with blue eyes worth that risk? Probably not. Nobody likes West Nile virus. No. While there are two main ones, there appear to be 16 genes that play a role in a person's eye color, each controlling other aspects of what makes a person as well. As for height, a 2020 study revealed that nearly 10,000 different genes play a role in a person's maximum height. That's a lot of gene editing to get one specific trait with a lot of unknown or unintended consequences. But look, let's say that our knowledge of the human genome is absolutely perfect and the appropriate alterations can be made to give a person blue eyes with no negative side effects. There's still a problem. CRISPR-Cas9 is incredible, and the advancements made with the technology have accelerated at a remarkable pace. But it isn't perfect. Sometimes CRISPR will miss and it will cut the wrong gene. Alternatively, even when it cuts out the correct gene to be replaced, sometimes the cell's repair mechanism could result in adjacent bits of DNA becoming scrambled from the simple cut. And you might be thinking now, well, you know, that's gonna be pretty rare, right? Well, no. According to a study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, one or both of these unintended editing outcomes occurs in 16% of human embryos. 
that is greater than one in seven and those are not odds that anyone should want to take then even if this doesn't have an unintended outcome we still don't know if there are any long-term effects of such gene editing not just for the individual but for all of humanity a parent may choose to remove or change a specific trait in their child but that doesn't just affect one person it affects their children and their children's children and so on depending on what traits people choose to modify we could see entire swaths of genetic diversity eradicated all in the name of vanity ethical concerns and finally we get to the crux of everything gene editing technology is here and it is rapidly evolving currently a designer baby as generally conceived by the public isn't possible but it's really not far off unless you're already 90 or are going to die suddenly and unexpectedly there's an extremely high chance that you will see this technology come to fruition within your lifetime in the grand scheme of things we are extremely close but are we going to take that final step there are a lot of ethical concerns surrounding designer babies enough that gene editing of human embryos is illegal in most of the world the public is not exactly on board either though opinion varies based on demographic and the exact purpose of the editing it should go without saying that the highly religious are far more against any sort of gene editing than those who are less fervent in their religious convictions also fairly intuitive is that men are more in favor of the research and implementation than women after all our bodies aren't being experimented on and our eggs aren't being harvested all we have to do is jizz in a cup and then crack open a beer and watch some sort of sports game more interestingly the more a person knows about gene editing technology the more in favor of the research they are this means that as public awareness of what's actually going on increases beyond sensationalized headlines people may start to come around to this area of science however there seems to be a fairly clear decision distinction with how people want to be used people resoundingly approve of the technology being implemented to prevent a child from being born with a severe genetic disease such as molly and her anemia when it comes to editing that would merely improve resistance or even grant immunity for a severe disease like jiang kai was trying to do but failing spectacularly people are generally in favor but with a lower margin however across nearly all demographics people were wildly against the idea of actual designer babies focused on things like increased intelligence unfortunately there was one demographic that had a nearly 50 50 split on whether these more vain alterations should be made and that demographic was male scientists who were well versed in the concepts of gene editing if that's the group in favor of it it's going to take a lot more than an opinion poll to get them to stop playing god aside from what may or may not be popular there are serious ethical concerns should society agree to take this step people agree that gene editing to remove severe diseases is a good idea but where do you draw the line and who decides what is severe enough of an abnormality to be edited out though it starts off pretty simple as most people would not argue a parent should not be able to cure their child of a deadly disease or down syndrome but what about bipolar or ocd those can severely impact a person's quality of life but depending on the severity of the condition and the individual person they may find it beneficial someone who is able to manage their ocd rather than be debilitated by it could find that it makes them strive for perfection in a way that helps them advance their career once it gets to editing an embryo's physical or mental characteristics things get even worse like nazi super soldier worse what is the ideal or correct picture pigmentation for a person's eyes their hair their skin the answer is that there is none because genetic diversity is a good thing for all species but there are a lot of people who feel otherwise and then there are other attributes like athletic or mental abilities currently the world anti-doping agency already has a ban on gene editing among its athletes despite the fact that it isn't quite possible yet nor is it something that can really be tested for however their ban on it raises an interesting question about fairness how could people born naturally compete with those who have been edited for enhanced performance and in the early stages before Gattaca becomes a reality and nearly every child in the world is born from gene editing how will the two groups interact resentment and disgust between the two groups is almost a certainty and the results and discrimination could be devastating and while we're on the subject of the early stages who's going to get early access unless current laws change in the United States anyway you could bet your ass it's going to be the wealthiest of the wealthy remember it isn't actually illegal in America research just won't be funded by the government if Jeff Bezos wants to bankroll an army of super babies there are currently no laws in place to stop him doing it the gap between the wealthy and a 
everyone else has been increasing, and unequal access to gene editing would only make things worse. Not only would the designer babies be born into families of immense privilege, a massive advantage as it already is, they would just be better. There would be no need for parents to bribe colleges to let their kids in because they would be designed at a genetic level to be the most deserving applicants. But then there's the other side of the coin. Yeah, designer babies could result in civil strife, greater income inequality, and potential genocide. But there's an upside. If children were genetically modified for greater intelligence, what good could they do for the world? Perhaps all of the problems with the economy, climate change, and, and McDonald's' inability to make the McRib available year-round could be solved thanks to a generation of super-intelligent designer babies. For the greater good. Ultimately, the question isn't how close are we to designer babies. Look, we're not there yet, but we're shockingly close, and with dedicated research, it could happen sooner than most of us would guess. The real question here is do we even want this? Sure, we probably want a world free of genetic diseases that kill children, but do we want parents to be able to pick and choose the traits? of their kids? And are we willing to extract and fertilize women's eggs solely that we can experiment on human embryos rather than for the purposes of in vitro fertilization? It is a dangerous box to open, and currently enough scientists and governments are opposed to it that our ability to advance the technology is going to be restricted. But should that sentiment change, we should all be very concerned with where they place the line of what is acceptable and how quickly that line starts moving.